Tyler, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think we can all agree that it's been a wild year for AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like something has changed, right? Like, for so long, the narrative has been the US innovates and the EU regulates. But that seems to be changing. Now, Pierre Alexander, you told me backstage that you come bearing good news. Tell us about <laughs> what is changing. No, absolutely, Melissa. Look, uh, there is this joke uh, in, in the tech world that uh, China and the US uh, bring hardware and software and the EU brings regulation. And <laughs> somehow, uh, this is still a bit true, but there is an immense wind of change. So, uh, as, as a founder, as an investor, where you locate, where you're going to grow your business is one of the most important, the most strategic decision. And of course, over-regulation and a very strong uh, policy environment is really crucial in that decision, eh, where you locate and where you grow your business. Um, and if you think about at the EU level over the past four or five years, you could see that the part was very much on regulation over innovation. And there's been a change in the sense that um, the von der Leyen Commission number two has been really pushing over investment and innovation much more than regulation. If you look at how the new commission is being structured, it's much more about how do we catch up, uh, how Europe catch up with the US and China in the context of uh, tech and AI specifically. And basically, you know, what are we going to do about it? If you think about President Macron uh, a couple of days ago, mentioned, you know, like we have to change, especially in the context of the recent EU election, we have to change. Something has to change in Europe. And we cannot think about regulating before reaching a stage of maturity in AI and tech. So I see across the board, uh, if you think about the Draghi report, which is basically what's going to drive uh, decision, massive investment decision in Europe over the next 10 years, it's all about that. It's all about uh, innovation, investment, somehow over regulation. So somehow for investors and, uh, and, and, and uh, early stage founders, uh, it's, it's probably the best you can, you, can, you can get. Now that's a really different vision from the past, say, five years, right? Where um, the narrative in, in Brussels was that we're going to regulate the tech we want into existence. If we've put the rules in place, the responsible AI will come and follow. I mean, Dorothy, how's that going? I mean, I think there's a lot of responsible and the come and follow is still to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think we've put so much attention on getting to ethical, responsible AI in Europe. And I think that's a great first step. I also never think that compliance is sufficient for public trust. Mm. You have to be showing that you have foresight on a lot of these issues um, from you know, the, the harms that large language models can cost and how you're going mi to mitigate them, all the way to techniques around watermarking and things like SynthID, which is something we've worked on at Google DeepMind. Um, you have to engage with communities that are going to be affected. I mean, when we launched our Nobel-winning uh, system called AlphaFold, which is a scientific system that predicts how proteins take shape. If you remember in the coronavirus, all of our therapeutics were built around that spike protein. That's why they called it coronavirus. Um, we basically predicted the shapes of all 200 million known proteins in one go. And it used to take up to four years of a PhD for one single protein. So you can think about how much progress has come there. And when we were putting it together, we had one design partner called the Drugs for Neglected Disease Institute, working with scientists in the field to progress on neglected diseases that were affecting 2x the number of people who died from COVID globally. But we also worked really closely with up to 30 different bioethicists to understand what the impact was going to be if we released it and did it through a public-private partnership with the European Bioinformatics Institute. So I think there's a lot more of that type of innovation that can happen in a responsible way that actually has very little to do with regulation. What I would love to see regulation push towards, in addition to risk management, is actually where do you want to see AI applied in the world for public good? So the example I'll give you is, why is it still so hard to get impact in health, energy, and education from AI. These are areas where we've always talked about were important for AI to address, and yet it's easier to get personalized coffees and soda drinks from AI today, the way the investments work, rather than health, energy, or education. What are we going to do to change that? I think government has a huge role to play. That's so interesting. Now, Pierre Alexander, what do you think? Like, is there an opportunity here for Europe? Like, what could we be doing? 
No, absolutely. So first of all, I mean, uh, the first part of the conversation was very much about this, this shift that we start to mm -hmm. see in the policy landscape. So we're going to be talking about AI EU policy, and there is a shift indeed, you know, kind of away from over-regulation, maybe towards innovation investments. Now, the big question you can ask is, um, you know, hell is paved with good intentions. So are we still in <laughs> a intention space? Is that just a good intention and then, you know, no, nothing will happen? Um, I believe that good things will happen and the, 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 the coming decade will be very much uh, Europe catching up somehow. I'm not saying leading you know, over the US and China, but really catching up to pretty much the, the, the place that it should have. And why? Because, you know, Europe got talent first of all. Mm. So they are like really, really strong. It's not like you start from scratch, you start from, from nothing. Europe has an immense talent pool. You know, if you look at the top AI scientists yeah, that, you know, publish in NeurIPS, which is the standard AI conference, you know, for deep learning and, and else. Um, if you look at the top, top of these AI scientists, most of them were trained as undergrads in Europe mm. than in the US. What the US is really, really incredibly good at is being this talent magnet. Yes. And if you look at founders, you know, in the Silicon Valley, 60% are not US born. So what the US is doing is attracting is this magnet of talents at the world scale. But Europe is extremely good as a very strong engineering talent pool. Um, I come from France and I can, I can see like a lot of top AI scientists being trained in France. Uh, absolutely top engineering, mathematical foundation. Um, we start to see also, by the way, in France, uh, the emergence of a very strong AI ecosystem mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen, you know, that didn't exist like three, four years ago. But there is something, there is a wind of change, and we also see the seed to sustain some kind of growth of a tech and, and AI-driven ecosystem. So why again? One, because of this talent. Two, because of the, of the research. Uh, three, Maybe because of uh, oh, all right, wait, wait. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, three because uh, there might be a moment where once we grow a critical mass of AI tech and products, we might also uh, benefit from this element of trust. Mm -hmm. So uh, Europe has a brand when it comes to you know trusting toys, food, you know, different elements that can really be leveraged. And when you think about the integration of AI and blockchain and sensors, and you might have like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tools that might be also very risky in your house or, you, you know, uh, trust become really essential and we can also capitalize on that. Um, what also Europe has, if you look at figures, the US compared to China, uh, compared to European countries, it's, it's, it doesn't look great. If you group countries as an EU bloc, a bit better, but still not great. Now, if you look at where innovation takes place, innovation takes place in like little pockets yeah. of Silicon Valley, of Beijing, of Paris, of Munich and Eindhoven. Helsinki? And now, <laughs> Helsinki, of course. <laughs> Helsinki, of course. And if you think about not looking at innovation at the national scale or at the block scale, but these hubs, mm. you see that Paris is doing as well as the Cambridge-Boston area in the field of AI, mm. which is like mind-blowing. Munich's doing great, Helsinki is doing great. So Europe has hubs that also we can use and we can le leverage to make this intention, this vision a reality in the coming years. Now, that all sounds great, but if I'm a top AI engineer, right, I can earn a million dollars in Silicon Valley. How can, I, how can we get that top talent to stay? Yeah, go for it. All right. <laughs> well, that's an easy question. No, you have so, no, I'm joking. Of course, that's, that's, a big, that's a big issue, like the, the gap. Uh, indeed, you're talking about one, one million. If you integrate some kind of stock option, it's more like 1.5. I mean, it can be immense. While as a uh, recently graduated like, computer scientist in, uh, in Paris, you will start maybe with like 4,000, 5,000 a month. So like, it's, it, it can be a 1 to 10, depending on the position. So the, the, the gap is real. Um, and I think we, we also need to think about another element, which is investment. So we, not, yes. we need to match investment um, also at, at the level of, of the US. W whether that can be done quickly, the answer is no. You know, it, but it, where we can get there, there is potential. Why? Because if you think about our uh, pension system right now in Europe, there are a few exceptions that have a pension fund system where basically money gets in and can be reinvested. And you capitalize on the growth of your economy. And then that's what you get back when you retire. Right now, a lot of European countries don't have this system, which means there's no money. There's just no money. And we know that 
investments are very local. You know, Europe invests in Europe, US invests in US to, to a large extent. So um, how do we get there if we want to compensate also to, you know, at, at the level of at the global scale? It's also by rethinking our investment systems and also uh, in this very small pool of investment money that we have, there are rules and regulations right now in Europe that restrict the ability of pension fund to invest in, in early stage uh, funds. Why? Because it's, it's too risky, it's seen as risky. The US lifted this regulation in 1975. So basically, we have you know, actions, we have levers that we can activate to contribute to start filling this gap. Now, that kind of relates to Google DeepMind, right? Or the story of Google DeepMind, yes. which is like the amazing success, but also kind of the tragedy for Europe, right? Because you were started in Europe and you had to go to the US to get the money and to grow and, and now you're acquired, uh, well, DeepMind was acquired by Google. I mean, what do you see as like the challenges? And, but also, how could we build a Google DeepMind in Europe in 2024 or five? There's so many layered answers to that. I would say we, even from the beginning, we had to raise money from the US. So our first investors were all from the US, which is really interesting. And, and the reason that we were able to stay in Europe was actually because our founder, Demis Asabas, just said, I'm not moving. He wanted to be in London. I do think it contributes to the culture of the company. If you see the types of problems that DeepMind is going after, especially in the natural sciences and how we apply AI and our leadership there, that comes from this interdisciplinary way of thinking where you have in the city of London so many different types of subjects, whereas, you know, coming from the US, I would say the US has more industry towns. You know, York is a finance town, DC is a government-based town, Silicon Valley is tech. And in London, you have all of those things in one place. So you're naturally going to have more chances to collaborate, more exposure, more um, different ways of thinking that are much more diverse in terms of mindset and incentives. And so I think what it demonstrated really well was attract, to Pierre's point, so much talent to come to London. We were also able to do that, especially at that time, because immigration was very clear and easy. Um, and it was easy for people to bring their families over, um, and we created an environment that people wanted to be a part of. So I think that was really, really important. And once he did that, if you look at the London ecosystem today, uh, the amount of American VC firms opening offices to invest in AI, the spin-outs coming out from Google DeepMind, um, and we found, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times a day I get a WhatsApp message from VC saying, I think this person's leaving, what are they doing? <laughs> uh, and so you create, start creating that ecosystem that wants to exist in that area. You've also seen that in other areas like um, FinTech in London because the UK created a sandbox with the FCA. Right. And so right. I think what's interesting is it's not just organic. Government plays a role no. in making the local environment very amenable to start companies. I actually have two angel investments in France, for example, and they're both um, extremely, I would say, public service oriented. Um, one is uh, Spore Bio, which detects contaminations almost instantly, and it usually takes up to two weeks. You have to close a factory or a restaurant, but now they use AI to basically detect contaminations instantly. Another one is called Matrisis, and it uses AI MRI technology to detect endometriosis for women instantly, where right now it's the only diagnosis is surgical and takes up to 10 years. So there's amazing applications in public services, largely because I think compared to the US, where I'm from, you have a public service sector that is in, that is national. In the US, we have to go to the states and cities to get that kind of service. So there's a huge role that government can create a market for mm. if they want to direct those investments. Please. If you don't mind, because I, yeah, I really want to follow it. up on that. Uh, first, totally agree with this very interesting vision and connects with the point I was making about the fact that we have these AI hubs, maybe at the country scale, maybe not at the country scale, but the cities, they really are very special. Yes. We're talking about London, the same point can be made about Paris, no bias here. The same point <laughs> in terms of like being the centralized spot of tech, finance, and, and somehow government, which is very strong as, as a scale where you can have great things coming up because of the interaction and what we call knowledge spillovers uh, in this literature. And the second thing is that um, as, as a trained economist, something that happens once you have something great to sell and it's very cheap is that you start to attract demand. Yes. So in this case, what we have, is cheap talent so far. 
So what happens when you have cheap talents, then you start to attract also investments and you see OpenAI opening an office, you know, like a few, a few weeks ago in Paris. Yes. And a big reason why you're going to start to see also tech moving to Europe is because there is talent and there is exactly some of this talent just doesn't want to leave. You know, for whatever reason, some of this talent is very not mobile. So then you will start to see the other way around and you will see, start to see the ecosystem moving in. Um, and then over time, what happens like then? you catch up on salaries. But this is something that we'll see uh, increasingly in the, coming, in the coming years. And do you think, you know, what happened in the US election, right? And the kind of, again, new geopolitical tensions, like is that gonna change anything? Like how are you seeing, what do you think? Oh, you uh, sorry. I mean, personally, I think that the social structures um, and safety nets of Europe actually encourage people to take bigger risks. So, we should be capitalizing on that. In the US, if you leave your very comfortable corporate job, you leave your healthcare benefits. That's not true in Europe. You have all these benefits and you should be able to take advantage of that and say, I'm going to start a new thing, I want to le take that leap and not really worry as much as you would in an environment that's much less stable, much less secure. And so I think we should really be taking advantage of that, encouraging people to try. It is, it's interesting because that comp that's complemented with failure being celebrated in the US in a way that I think you, Europe, at, at least in my experience over the past seven, eight years, has been a lot more risk averse. So how do we take the best of both worlds and really make sure that people have the opportunities to, to try new things? And especially when it comes to diverse founders, where I think the affordances for failure are, are lower everywhere. Yeah, what do you think? I, I will answer this question on the recent you know, presidential election, but I want to say one thing before that connects a bit more closely to, to what Dorothy just said, which is I think Europe needs to be a bit more proud. Americans are very proud, <laughs> and Europeans are very modest. And Europeans have to be a little bit more proud also on you know, our quality of life in, in Europe. We do have, you know, I would say, the most incredible cities in the world in terms of quality of life in terms of uh, sustainability, in terms of mobility, in terms of somehow inclusion as well. So we do, have, uh, we do have a problem of branding. The US has the best branding machine in the world, <laughs> and, that's, and that's called Hollywood. You know, I grew up watching Friends, I don't know if you watched this episode, where I thought I could be a waiter and, and live in a fantastic New York City apartment in, you know, in the village, which does not happen. Mm. But somehow, this is in the mind of pretty much anywhere in the world. It's like this American dream is completely portrayed also through Hollywood and through, there is a very strong branding. And I could not tell you how many of my colleagues from the US come to Europe and it's like, wow. Yes. Loving the lifestyle, loving the lifestyle. And we have to celebrate that. Um, you mentioned healthcare and all those things. There's so much that we could do to attract this talent. Make it easy also in terms of visa. Just make talent come here and make it effortless. Yes. Because when talent is here, get five years of education, you might find a partner, you might find a job there, and you stay. Let's attract talent aggressively and let's brand the, grand, the, the beautiful things that we have in Europe, in Helsinki, in Paris, you know, let's brand that because it's true, but it's not that well known. Mm -hmm. So we need to, you know, diffuse that a little bit more. Now in the context of the presidential election, and you just have to watch how European leaders have reacted to mm -hmm. uh, President Trump re-election. Great job, okay, of course, you know, you have to say it, <laughs> great job, you know, but also Okay, now uh, we cannot be dependent anymore, you know, military. What happens if uh, the US, you know, pull out from, from Ukraine or NATO? I mean, military independence is key. So now th there were a sense of importance mm. of being independent, of being sovereign. Now there is a sense of urgency. Mm. We cannot wait anymore. Emmanuel Macron said the same thing a, a week ago. It's like, that's it. You know, maybe great things will happen in the US, hope for the best, but also we cannot rely on, you know, military, on tech. If you think about, like, wh when you ping an API call, where does it go? I mean, wh where is the cl cloud computing power? Who are the cloud? Where is the infrastructure? So, in a sense, I think there is this really immense sense of urgency that the presidential election pushed uh, for Europe to be sovereign and to be really in charge of its own destiny. So, I think this is changing at least uh, the timeline of this uh, investment of a regulation story. Can I add to that a bit? So if you want cloud computing infrastructure in Europe, I also think that you need to make it possible to train AI models here. That's a very hard thing to do today. 
when there are certain text and data mining exceptions, which are actually in EU law, that just vary in terms of how they're being applied. So I do think we really need to make it easier to train models here, do more work here. I know Google DeepMind and Google want that to happen, no. but it's a slow-moving conversation. Um, what would European leadership in AI look like? Like, dream scenario. What, what do you want to happen? What should happen? Okay. Happy to. Um, I, I think there is only one way, and that's not what we do right now in terms of AI leadership in Europe, because right now what you have is a collection of systems, French system, German system, where you try to build a French... I mean, there is still this narrative. I was invited at a VC dinner <laughs> in Paris, and everybody around me was the same type of people with the same type of French names went to the same schools. Mm. It's a French ecosystem. Mm. The German ecosystem is very German. Mm. You look at the, the research uh, initiatives in France, in Germany, in the UK, it's very much still not pan-European. And what I think is not an option is like, we will never ever have France or Germany catching up with the US or China, ever. Europe has a chance if we think European first, and I'm completely including, you know, the UK in that conversation because, you know, historically it makes sense, and you know, Brexit is, uh, is is an historical incident that hopefully, you know, will have a return to the mean somehow. But in terms of integration within the RNI system, research and innovation system, we need to think Europe first. So we need to smooth out also labor law. We need to make it easy mm -hmm. for a Dutch company to hire a French engineer yes. that wants to stay in France. Otherwise, you need to have different corporations, different, it's, it's too complex. Labor laws, fiscal laws, we need integration. And if you go back to the, you know, the three major reports that came out this year to drive EU innovation policy and competitiveness and industrial policy, Draghi, Leta, and the, the team of Tirol, it's all about creating, like, accelerating the integration of Europe. Because if you think about one of our greatest product and technology in Europe, and it's through Airbus. So there is one thing where, one of the uh, very complex technology where we can compete with the US and China, and that is, you know, aerospace and defense. We, we, do, we do that very, very well. But what happened is that in, in, you know, in the, the post-Second World War uh, era, there were this time where we realized that we could not keep our research innovation system, you know, fragmented. Germany, France could not do you know, their own things. We had to unite, and now we have a European company called Airbus that is actually able to de deliver a very complex product at scale because it's a European vision. Mm -hmm. So, if you ask like the vision for like an AI uh, leadership in Europe, it has to be European, and we need to work on breaking borders as much as possible. I mean, everyone in AI is so obsessed with building models. Like, the bigger model, the better. And obviously, we all know how expensive and hard that is. I mean, what do you, Dorothy, think? Like, is that the right approach? Is that what Europe should be focusing on? I actually think Europe has a real advantage in the application layer or the translation layer between a foundation-based model, which takes, to your point, a lot of capital and a lot of resource, and translating that into the local context, but not just the local context, but to different verticals. Everybody assumes that AI is just like any general technology. And if you remember Google Search, you plug the search plugin into any vertical, and it probably indexed and worked better than what was there before. That's not true for AI. It's going to take real partnership between experts to say, is this model working the way it's supposed to um, in, in re deeply regulated areas like transportation and health to make sure that the models are working as intended. So I think Europe has a real opportunity at that application layer, that translation layer, where you have a whole series of startups that are working across health, finance, transport, um, energy to really make the most of AI in those fields with relevant experts. That's something that I think Europe could invest deeply in and actually doesn't take that much compute to do and could be a real advantage. I would add on that the fact that in the US, we don't have centralized like national data banks the way that the NHS does in the UK, for example, or the way that Iceland's digitized everything or Estonia. That is a real advantage for Europe, but nobody's quite figured out how to crack it. And I think that's really worth thinking about. Are the institutions governing those data sets? 
are they still fit for purpose? If you, if you ask people in climate what the biggest barrier to climate impact from AI is, they will say data formatting. That is something that can be easily fixed. Data libraries, data formatting, if Europe takes that on, that could really direct where AI investments go in a meaningful way. And that's a great point about the data. Um, top tip for anyone here thinking about a next startup. Um, but I, I wanted to push back a bit about on what you said about the applications and you sure. know, focusing on that instead of building the models. Doesn't that make us kind of more um, dependent on the US if we rely on US models instead of building our own, you know, with our own culture or language? I think it depends on your theory about whether you think base models um, can't be managed or fine-tuned. Um, and if you're not doing inferencing in a way that is going to be able to adjust to what you need. I'm not sure that's true, and I think there still remains to be seen. But I do think a lot of these open source models um, and a lot of the code that we put out there and the environments that we put out there already as Google DeepMind are easily manageable and can be managed into any given situation. One of the interesting projects we're working on um, related to education, for example, will enable uh, different groups to basically adjust to their local uh, needs and culture. And that's because edu education system is completely different. And it's not going to be possible for a global company to adjust to every single one of them. But that's not true for local startups. And so I think it's going to be about empowering that local ecosystem to be able to build on top of existing models. Um, and you know, it, it could be worth investing in a base model. I just think that that is, when you think about the trade-offs of where you would spend compute and, and where Europe can differentiate itself, it really, for me, is at that application layer. Okay, great. And all right, this is all being fantastic, but we have a lot of startups in the audience, and I bet all of them are wanting to know, like, so what, what should I do? Like, where do I go next? So Pierre Alexandre, what's your advice? What should startups do? European startups? Yes. Okay. So um, I want to follow up actually on this point on the application layer, okay. because that's your segue. You know, that's, that's your segue. Okay. No, no, I mean, in the context of founders. Mm -hmm. That's your segue. Um, if you wish, the, 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 the US AI uh, jumpstart was really about mastering internet data at scale and use the fact that, you know, US is a big market and very integrated market. But in the application space, and when you think about enterprise data, then there is a lot of opportunities for European startup because it's a much more gate-kept market. So if you want to work with you know, the French health data, it's going to be much easier if you enter from a, you know, from a French perspective as well. Yeah. So in the application space, there are indeed fantastic opportunities uh, for startup. And basically, it's all about being narrow enough and find a niche but, but there are many, there are many uh, where there is potential also not to necessarily compete uh, with big VC money. And then if you think about uh, another shift, we talked about the shift at the beginning, but there is another shift also uh, in the founder space, which is maybe you know, having a, a, a ton of VC money is not the only way. You can also bootstrap, show yeah. revenue. And one advantage that also Europe has is, again, cheap talent. So we can leverage on that. So if you combine the you know, interaction between uh, these application layers where there is com some kind of comparative advantage and you know, access to talent and the ability to show revenue quickly, then that's also uh, an opportunity and th that could be the focus. Instead of trying to chase and to match the big numbers that you can have in the US to tackle problems that are also at a much bigger scale for now. Fantastic. And Dorothy, what advice would you give startups? Think about problem selection really carefully. I mean, not every problem is great for AI to tackle. One of the reasons why alpha folds and protein folding was such a great problem was three properties. I would say it's um, the fact that we had the protein data bank as a great data source. Uh, we also had a huge combinatorial space that AI could sift through. And on top of that, you had benchmarks that were established by the biology community to measure your progress against. Those three components made protein folding a perfect problem for AI. And I think once you start thinking about that, it makes product market fit much more obvious and clear from the outset. Uh, and there's so much opportunity there. But I think problem selection is incredibly important, both from an investment perspective, because investing shows what you believe about the future and what you want the future to look like, and also from a founder perspective in terms of how you're making trade-offs in terms of resources. Fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you.
you both so much for this, and thank you for um, joining us today. Thank you. Have a great slush. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs>